Good morning again. So we're continuing our conversation about into the deep. We've got to be getting pretty deep by now. We're all the way through Lent here. Deep thirst, that spiritual dryness that God quenches abundantly. Then deep reflection, not what we see, but through God's eyes. And what God sees is very good. Even in deep troubles, God is still able to redeem us, which brings us into a deep relationship with God and gives us courage to dive deep into a deep water encounter with our faith in Christ. Phew! That's a lot, isn't it? Everyone holding their breath through all that? Let's take a big deep breath. We're back up. Okay. Now today, in thankfulness, we seek to follow God with deep devotion. The one who breathed life into our bodies and new life through Jesus Christ. Say this with me. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Palm Sunday is the final Sunday of Lenten season. It is the culmination of our journey into the deep. And Palm Sunday is the end of Jesus' journey in more ways than one. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity to be here with you, to uh, feel your presence, to say, Hosanna, save us. May we hear your voice in the midst of my attempts to share your word, but mostly that your spirit would speak to each one of us, that we would break down the barriers of things in the way and just hear you and know that you're calling us, not on that phone, but in a different way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's just the morning we're having. You know, poor Miguel's up here and the keyboard went dead on us. I don't know if you noticed or not, but uh, he had to play his phone instead of the keyboard and just all sorts of things are going on. But we, we continue into this conversation about Palm Sunday. In Matthew, in the passage we heard today, they almost got it right. The people who followed Jesus almost got it right. The disciples did as Jesus directed them, went and got a donkey and a colt, which is a sign of humility riding a donkey and triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Those were what they would appear to the people that day. The people cut and wave palm branches just like we did today. Thank you all who participated. I appreciate that. It's a sign of victory. Uh, Whenever there was a victory in the uh, campaigns, they would wave palms. They spread their cloaks on the ground, it says. Now that, this is interesting because what, what matters, not that it's their clothes, but because it's cloth. Most likely what they were doing was uh, laying down cloth on the ground, which is what other religions would do to welcome uh, the gods that arrived. So welcoming God, they got that right. They cried out, Hosanna, which actually means save us. They named Jesus son of David, which God had promised David that the first rightful king of Israel would, that his throne would be established forever. And we hear about that in 2 Samuel, beginning in verse 12, uh, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. When, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring for you. You shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So it was really important that this this lineage of David would continue. So they got that right. They shouted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is a reflection of Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. They were doing everything right. And they got so close to getting it. But when the whole city asked, who is this? You know, I mean, this is a big parade coming in, people waving stuff and they're all over and people are like freaking out. And they're like, who is this? They get, we get this from the people. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. They missed the point. The crowd called Jesus a prophet. Who is Jesus? 
louder, say it out loud. <laughs> Son of God, good, yeah, the Messiah, the, all those things. And they call him prophet. I think they missed the completeness of the moment. And when I read that this week, I was really kind of taken back by that. So I went to each one of the four Gospels. And it's unusual that all four Gospels speak into an event. But because it's in the Holy Week and we're coming into that time, I went back and looked at each one of the Gospels. For instance, in Mark 11.10, it says, Blessed is the coming kingdom. It doesn't talk about the Messiah. It just says that the kingdom's still coming, but no mention of Jesus as the Messiah. In Luke 19 verse 37, as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen. Oh good, we've seen all this stuff that's going on. It's really good. The kingdom must be coming. Great stuff. They call him king, but no mention of Messiah. Again, carrying on the promise of King David, we'll call him king again, so we continue that, but they missed the point. Even the disciples in John 12, his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, when Jesus rose from the dead, they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. And as we heard today, Matthew's people called him a prophet. You see, on Palm Sunday, when Jesus had this triumphal entry, everyone showed devotion to Jesus because they saw him as the way to victory, the the promise of victory. But this human, this man, this Jesus himself was the victory. Jesus is the victory. Amen? And it wasn't They didn't get it because Jesus was hiding it. I mean, all through this passage today, we get indicators that this is definitely who Jesus is. Everything was pointing to Jesus. Verse 2, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey uh, tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. In Matthew's account, Jesus rode both. This was a big question in my Bible study this week. They said, "Why, why do you ride both? Well, the answer is it's fulfilling a prophecy. If you go back to Zechariah 9, 9, I hope all my compromands are excited because they know what Zechariah is and even where Zechariah is right now. They like that. But Zechariah 9, 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious. Is he humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. So it was answering that. That's the reason it, uh, that he was riding both. On the very next verse, He says, if anyone asks them, tell the Lord, tell them the Lord needs them. This is when he has sent the disciples in verse, in verse three, he has sent the disciples to go steal a donkey and a colt. Let's be honest. That's what he was doing. Send them to steal them. It sounds like, doesn't it? So of course he's got to have a line when they, when they say, Hey, what's going on here? Well, The interesting thing is the word Lord in in that passage can mean Lord or Master. And so the newer version of the Bible, the Common English Bible, says this. It says that the disciples said to the people, tell them, and then he points, basically talking about the donkey and the colt, he says, tell them their master needs them. Well, that's completely different reading, isn't it? From the NR, tell them the Lord needs them. Kind of, it is their master leads them, which, which may be a better translation. And again, hinting that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. Luke 19, the Pharisees tell the crowd to be quiet. And he answers, I tell you, if these, if these were silent, the rocks and the stones themselves would shout out. That's that rocks and stones would cry. The rocks and the stone rolled away would soon speak for themselves. We will hear about later, won't we? You see, their devotion only went through the triumphal entry in Jerusalem. When it, when it was realized that their promise was in the form of a fragile human. When victory would cost so much more than just palm waving, they all deserted Jesus. But deep devotion is to follow Jesus to the cross. Amen? Matthew 20, 16, 24, Jesus says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves 
and take up their cross and follow me. Deny themselves, take up the cross, follow me. Anything else is simply on the surface. So we've entered into the deep with Jesus, but are we willing to go to the cross? Matthew goes on to say in verse 25, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. On Palm Sunday, we've waved our palms in devotion to Jesus. We want victory over sin and death, don't we? Yeah. Is anybody else here? We want victory over sin and death, right? All right, give me some thumbs up online too there. Give me the like. All right, that's, that's what we want. We want victory over sin and death, but we want it comfortably. We want a comfortable cross to carry. We want to pray, bless this food, but not take my life. We want to be the presence of Christ for the world when it's convenient. We don't want to give until it hurts. We want to follow and serve Jesus on our terms. Amen? Well, it's time, brothers and sisters, to go deep into the deep devotion of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the victory. His sacrifice was the only way for us. I think we forget that sometimes. We think, well, if we just read the Bible, if we do good things. No, it's all about Jesus' sacrifice for us. That was the only way. Amen? Let me hear a better amen than that. This is the, this is the heart of our faith, folks. This was the only way. Amen? Amen? Thank you. I appreciate that. So that's what we want to do is follow deeply. Jesus is our sacrifice. Victory literally came in Jesus' body and blood. Hung on a cross. Nails through his body. The death of a criminal. And that became victory over death. You know, when we come to that place, many will turn back. We'll head to the surface no matter how far we deep dive deep. Peter did when Jesus was arrested. We hear about that in Matthew 26. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you are one of them for your accent betrays you. He must have been from the south or somewhere else. I'm not sure. But then it says in 74, then he began to curse and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. We deny Jesus. We do it all the time. Amen? We all head to the surface sooner or later. But here's the good news. Even though we do that, even though we keep turning back, he waits with us. He waits for us with open arms when we get closer, when we dive deeper and deeply devote ourselves to God. And that proof came to us nowhere else but on the cross when he said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. We don't know what we're doing. I can get an amen for that, I know. <laughs> But Christ will show us the way if we do deeply devote our lives to him. Deep devotion is the response we're to give in thanks. God, God climbed up on the cross for us, died for us. And, and what we can do is be devoted to God, devoted to Jesus, so we to be thankful for what he's done. So maybe, may we pick up our cross and follow the divine human gift. May we continue deeply into the life of Christ, even when it's costly. May we receive this gift of victory over death in the body and blood of Jesus, remembering that only through his death and resurrection are we given eternal life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.